as soon as we started selling e-commerce and building an e-commerce, um, I immediately was like, I'm making a huge mistake here. Um, and it was because we, at the time it was related to the project specs, right? We were really having trouble going, well, how many products is this thing? And what categories do we have? And mm. what's our shipping look like? And how are you going to fulfill? And we started asking all these questions and it just would turn out the client had literally no clue, right? They just are going, I don't know. I just, I, I thought I'd, uh, you know, make t-shirts and sell them online. I have no idea how I'm going to deliver them. And so what started as product specs um, started becoming like, we've got to figure this out before we can actually do it. So the tech side is what tipped me to it. But I quickly learned that that could be applied just as equally to a business that says, you know, hey, we're a landscaping company and we've got, you know, we're doing okay in this 15 mile radius, but we want to go out wider, right? Well, the same exact principle comes in, like how many GMBs are we in? and how many website properties need SEO done and are we running ads? And it just, it would like turn into all these questions that I was really trying to keep my triage calls down to 15 to 20 minutes. And there was no way, like I'd be on the phone with a client for an hour, hour and a half, whatever. And it's like, I still didn't have all the data, right? Like I only knew what I knew. The devs that I had hired had different questions. The designers had different questions. Like I go to talk to Simon, he has different questions about how we're gonna drive traffic. And all of a sudden it's like, there's, I think it was really when I realized that it wasn't my mind only that the client needed. It was they needed my team to speak into their individual areas of their presence. And when I figured that out, I went, I can't do this, right? Because I started adding up how much does it cost me to put, you know, an SEO lead on a call, a tech lead, a design lead, like content person how long is this you know this is costing me you know three four hundred bucks minimally to have this call and i just it was like one of those moments of going i i gotta stop doing this right so i either have to stop doing this and just fire off proposals that i have no clue what the end result's going to be or i have to start getting paid to figure it out hey 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 Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another episode of the Agency Hour live here in the Digital Mavericks Facebook group and in your earbuds, wherever you are listening to your podcasts. Uh, hey, I'd be curious to know, by the way, if you're not in the Digital Mavericks Facebook group, why are you not in the Digital Mavericks Facebook group? Send us an email, support at agencymavericks.com and tell us a couple of things. One, if you're not in the Digital Mavericks Facebook group, why? Do you have, do you not like Facebook groups? Do you think we're a bunch of idiots? Do you not like my voice? Uh, are you, do you just have an aversion to Facebook? Is there another community that you would belong to if it wasn't Facebook? Not saying we're gonna build it, but I'm just curious. If you listen to this podcast and you're not in the group, send us an email, support at agencymavericks.com and tell us why. And the other thing I'm curious about is, where are you listening to this podcast? I don't mean like at the gym or walking the dog. I mean, what platform? Do you use to listen to this podcast are you listening on spotify downcast uh i don't know any of, of the other spotify I, I don't know if any other podcast players to be honest because i just use downcast and spotify but if you're listening to this podcast somewhere else we'd be we'd love to know uh just out of curiosity hey today we're going to talk about this is a, kind of a ridiculous headline but it happens to be true in uh today's episode we're going to talk about how you can convert your sales calls well kind of bit of a bit of a bait and switch here but how you can convert clients at 85 percent and uh, i'm very pleased to have with me and i can see in the green room he's just taking his seat i'm very pleased to have back with me on the agency hour today my good friend get ready ladies and gentlemen it is of course pete crispy butter perry <laughs> How are you, my brother from another from New York? Hey, man, I missed you. It's been a while. Well, welcome back. The show hasn't been quite the same without you. In fact, yeah, I right. think our listenership is up. Engagement is up. I think the overall quality of the show has lifted dramatically since you took a back seat. And <laughs> now you're back just to uh, settle I'm the averages. Bring it back down to earth. What's going on? What have you been up to? 
Oh, not much. Coaching my butt off and uh, dealing with all kinds of things like that. But um, yeah, you know, it's summer here. So, and it's evening. It's evening for me. So mm -hmm. it's, it's uh, I don't like to work. Uh, you know, like you, work life balance. Haven't you booked another trip overseas? I, we've, I've booked like four flights recently, one to San Diego, uh -huh. Uh -huh. which we uh -huh. can talk about, um, oh, one yeah. to Orlando, one to North Carolina, and also, yes, one to Italy. I was going to say those those three, just for your ge geographical uh, knowledge, those first three flights aren't overseas. San Diego, no, they're Orlando, not overseas. North, they're, they're not overseas. Uh, you might have to fly over a body of water to get there, yeah. but they're not overseas. And uh, where are you going? Sorry, where are you going? Was, was for, you're going to Italy again? Italy again, yeah. yeah, yeah. Fantastic. My wife Is and I it... are trying to, trying to kind of get in the habit of going to Italy every 18 months or so. Wow. I cannot get my head around getting on a plane and flying overseas. I'm about to do it in a few months, which we'll talk about in a second, but I can't get my head around it, man. Yeah. It's, uh, it's uh, been so long. It's so much different for you guys. Like it, we like kind of expect, like we're, we're beyond that now. And like, mm. you know, I'm not too worried about monkey pox. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not worried about monkey pox either. And, uh, uh, I'm so, more worried about yeah. getting a cold these days than anything. Um, uh, so yes, we should announce if we haven't already that in September this year, 2022, the second week of September, we will be in San Diego for MAVCON, which is our event that we run three times a year for our Mavericks club members. Uh, it is, we're doing it in person. It's live in person again, in a hotel in San Diego at the, I think it's at the Spring Hill Suites in uh, yeah. uh, Waterfront, Spring Hill Suites uh, in San Diego, which I'm super excited about. Uh, when, do you remember when we were there last, what was it, February 2020? It was February 2020. That's when we first met our today's guest, mm -hmm. which we haven't announced who he is yet, but that's mm -hmm. when we first met him. And uh, that was the last time, well, that was the last time I got to see you, my friend, mm -hmm. but that was mm -hmm. the last time we were ever all together. And uh it was a great yeah. venue, and we're going back to the same venue. Yep. It is and, a great uh, venue. It was a great event. Yeah. Uh, um, we had yeah. a bunch of guest speakers there that uh, that week. We had Chris Lemmer. We had um, Chris Martinez from Dude Agency. We had Dana Molstaff from Boss Mom. Uh, I'm sure I've forgotten someone, uh, but it'll come back to me. We had a we, bunch uh, of great speakers. We coaches met today, and mm -hmm. a tentative um, – not theme for it, but one of the one of the main topics, maybe one mm. of the days of the two days, um, is filling the top of your funnel. Ooh. Yeah. So we're, we're, there's probably eight to ten different legitimate ways to do that, and we're going to try to have somebody speaking on every one of those different ways. Great. And, of course, I'm going to host a session about the illegitimate ways to right. fill yeah, the yeah, top yeah, of the yeah, funnel. Yeah, That's yeah, my specialty. <laughs> yes. Gray hat and black hat is my middle name, right. ladies and gentlemen. Um, excellent. So this is very exciting. Yes, Sheila Hurd's got a great way to fill the top of the funnel. It's called dressing up as an astronaut. True story. Uh, when you ever speak to Sheila Hurd, ask her why she sends her business partner out dressed up as an astronaut. It's a true story. Um, I need to know. I don't know that story. <laughs> it's very funny. I've seen the photos. Uh, now today, now here's. So let's talk about let's talk about top of funnel, and let's talk about what happens when people come into the top of the funnel. Because typically speaking, I've said this hundred times, I think, in various platforms, in coaching calls, in trainings, on the agency hour, we're going to say it again, is that the typical process to close a new client for a web design agency or SEO agency or digital marketing agency is someone puts their hand up and says that they're potentially interested in, in looking at what it is you do. You optimistically jump on a call with them to kind of try and figure out if they're a good fit. You kind of fumble your way through it. And the, in fact, the success of that first call is measured by whether or not they ask you for a proposal. If they ask you for a proposal off that first call, then you think, great, this is looking good. Well, I've got some momentum. We bonded. We like each other. They potentially are trusting me enough to want to work with me and they want a proposal to nut out the details, which is fair enough. And that makes perfect sense because that's been the business model for years, right? Uh, it's also, in my opinion, completely broken and... It takes way too long and your conversion rate, if you're really good, your conversion rate might be 15 or 20% or if you, you know, maybe 30% of those people that you talk to and you send a proposal actually end up, you know, buying something from you. 
So what we've been working on over the last couple of years is a way to, first of all, shorten the sales cycle, acquire clients faster and increase that conversion rate. And every now and then we put something out into the world and it's remarkable to see someone pick it up and run with it and augment it and tweak it and turn it into something that is no longer recognisable and just to knock it out of the park. And one of those people that we talk about a lot here on the show is actually joining us for the first time as a guest here on the Agency Hour. And so, ladies and gentlemen, I'd please like you to welcome to the Agency Hour all the way from Williamsport, Tennessee, from Mule Town Digital, Adam Silverman. <laughs> hey, brother. Hey. How's, How's it going? going? Oh, I'm doing we're, good. We're yeah. all the more better for having you on the show. We, we talk about you just about every week on the show, so we thought we'd better get you on so that you can set us straight and let us know what's actually going on. So, hey, hey listen, for those that don't know, just give us the too long, didn't read version of... Who's Adam Silverman? What do you do and why are you here? Yeah, the too long didn't read version is I was a professional musician for uh, quite a long time, about 15 years out of Nashville. Uh, I was learning web development while I was traveling, got tired of traveling, decided to uh, stop doing that, opened an agency. Uh, not very long after I opened it, ended up in San Diego where I met you guys. That's pretty much it. <laughs> and, the, and the rest is history. So there's an interesting, why did, the, 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 I think there's an interesting sidebar here. Why did you want to stop traveling as a professional drummer? Um, I got to the, well, one, I was burned out because I was gone like almost 300 days a year. So I was just exhausted. Um, and I was starting to not like playing music as much because it was just wearing me down. Um, and then I also, uh, during that time, met my wife and she had an eight-year-old uh, son, and so he became my stepson, and we were wanting to have other kids, and I just got where I didn't want to leave home. So I was like, I don't, I don't want to be gone for, you know, 14 days. <laughs> I just didn't want to do it anymore. So um, it was just a, a logical pivot for me um, to, you know, just be able to stop traveling. Yeah, love it. It's funny, isn't it, as you get older, your priorities change? Like, a lot of people would think, dude, you're living the dream. You're a professional drummer. You're on tour the whole time. You're just, like, rock and roll. But it's funny as you get a bit on and particularly when kids come along uh, in whatever shape or form that happens, it, your priorities start to change. Uh, was it hard for you to kind of, was it hard for you to let go of the, the music thing or did you, have you since rediscovered it that you're not sort of grinding it out so much? Yeah, I think like I've definitely rediscovered it to a degree. Like I still get hired a lot to do session work. So I built a studio out of our, like off of our farm. I've got my own like space there. Um, and so like once I opened that up and it's interesting, like when you're a musician, you can't afford to buy the gear, right? Then you get to the place where like people start giving you the gear, but then you need more gear and it's more expensive and the electronics and like this, this afford me the ability to build out my studio and do all the things that I wanted to do. So now I kind of have that running on the side, but it's on my terms. I, I don't have to take a session. I don't want it. It like, looks like it's going to be horrible. I can just say no. So there's a lot of freedom in there now. Awesome. Uh, just getting a, a couple of glitches with the internet. Is that me? Is that on my end? Or no, is... it, it was on Adam's end. I think. Okay, cool. No Ooh. worries. Sorry. Um, so just, just bear with us there. That's all good. Um, so, so you start the agency. Uh, so how do you, how did that happen? Did you, you, you sort of learn how to build websites. How did you get your first handful of clients? Um, I was mostly uh, working for other agencies and so I was doing development work and that's kind of how I started the business um, and then people started asking me for like more than just that and, and I started thinking you know I could probably do more than just the, the the dev side and so I hired a designer and then a project manager and then it just started opening up from there. And why why web design? Just just let this, just or why web dev? Just take a step back. You're a professional drummer. How did you first? What was the first moment where you went? I think I can write some code that reflects as a website in a browser, and I think I might be able to get paid to do this. When was that moment? Ah, uh, so while I was touring, um, I got a job when I was home uh, working part time for a web hosting company in Tennessee. And so I was a customer service rep there and I didn't really know anything. I didn't even have a computer. Like I, I knew nothing <laughs> about the internet. Um, and I just started like, they were like, if you're not answering calls, here's a stack of books. And 
I landed at the time on like a, you know, XHTML and CSS2 probably, you know, book. And it was like, I just, I enjoyed it. And so I started doing this for their customers, like with their permission, of course, you know, I was working through the company for their customers, fixing mm -hmm. things that normally a hosting company would not fix. It's like, I can't get this button to work. It's like, I'd go in there and we'd bill them to fix it and they split that money with me. And so I kind of started developing that skill set on the job and then clients from there started hiring me outside of there. Um, again, the owner was like all for it. He was like, please just do this. When the hosting company shut down, all those clients had nowhere to go. And so mm. I was given permission to reach out and I took about 15, 20 clients straight out of there into a freelancer gig. And that's how I got started. Wow, that's a that's a pretty pretty nice platform to launch from, uh, and then cast your mind back to before you joined Mavericks Club in February 2020. What was your typical process like when someone put their hand up and said, "Hey, we're interested in working with you guys"? What is what did that process look like? Wow, man, it didn't look good. <laughs> it was it was a mess. I mean, most of the time, um, it was just like me trying to figure out what they needed. Right. And I just spent a lot of time going like, well, do you really need that? Or what if you need this? And I really didn't know what I was doing. So it was like, for me, I looked at those first probably 20, 30 calls. Like I have no idea how this is going to go. Um, fortunately, a lot of those people had already worked with me as a dev. And so it wasn't a big stretch for them to, now have designs done. Like I said, Hey, I can, I have a designer now. And people went, Oh, I, I want something done. So they weren't really that hard from a, you know, like a complexity standpoint. It was just, I didn't know what I was trying to get them to do. Right. So it's like, I get off the call and go, uh, how many hours is it going to take to do this thing? And how hourly billing you're a dad, that's all that, you know, you know, so that it was mostly me trying to figure out the hours and then, sending a proposal for those hours and you know it was, it was definitely not efficient at all and uh what what was the what was the conversation like once you submitted a proposal how did you scope out the budget was there sticker shock once you put the proposal in how many of those were converting just kind of walk us through what what what, what, what that looked like yeah like i do recall there being a good bit of sticker shock of people going whoa like you know you're charging you know, five, 10 grand or whatever for a site, you know, why? And um, there was a lot of like pushback against that. Um, you know, yeah, I, I can't really remember. The close rate was probably actually okay um, just because I already knew so many of the people, but the first like couple of organic people that came in, I remember just like constantly worrying that I was overpricing and like I wanted to help everyone. So I didn't want to, you know, push people off by like overpricing the services or making them like, I had this weird thing in my brain where I would make them feel bad if they couldn't afford to work with me. And so I would really like struggle with, you know, I was taking underpaid projects and, you know, I was doing the whole thing that probably everybody does, you know, it, it was, it was definitely strugglesome all the way around. So tell me when you when you joined Mavericks Club, I remember describing and I and I I know we've spoken about this, so I know I'm allowed to say this, but I remember describing you like you were a rabbit in the headlights when you came out to San Diego. You were like, I need to do something. I'm kind of overwhelmed. I'm not exactly sure what to do next. There's a lot of people in this room. You're very welcoming, but I'm kind of freaked out. Like, yeah. uh, what should I do next? And at some point, you decided that you were going to grow a team, right? You, why yeah. why did you decide to do that and not just do everything yourself? Man, I think it was because I knew from being, it was from being a freelancer for so long, like you just run out of runway where it's like, I don't know what else to create. And like, I didn't know anything about web design or web copy. I didn't know what a care plan was. Like I had no idea what any of these things were, what I was doing. I had just been taking care of people's websites for a long time. And I was trying to, I had an opportunity to build a development business. Like I was going to just build a white label dev company. And the reason I didn't do it was because I wanted to be a part of their business growth and not just the tech side. 
And so after working on the tech side for so long, I decided I really wanted to make that pivot. And I felt like I wanted that teamwork thing to, to drive it. And I also knew that I wanted to build a business eventually that I did not have to physically run, like that I could passively run a company that was always kind of on the list of, of what I wanted. Um, and so, yeah, it just felt like the only possible, you know, the only way to do that was to build a team. So that's why I wanted to do it. And I'm, I'm kind of setting us up here because I know the story here that eventually, you know, you get to a point where you have someone doing most of the other things and that the sales process is the last thing that you built yourself out of, which we'll get to in a minute. Um, who was the, but before we get there, who was the first person that you hired? Uh, my first hire was our designer, Leah. Um, she had worked with me at another agency where I was a contractor, like I was basically a fractional CTO at their agency. And I worked with her on the design side and that agency started kind of winding down and, and they weren't really taking on new clients and she was ready to do something new. And so I hired her. She was pretty much like a Navy year out of college um, at the time. She was my first hire. And then, I, so I would sell the thing, hand it off to her. Um, we did the whole thing where we gather the copy from the client. She'd do the designs, I would build them, and then we'd ship them out and we'd go to the next one. Um, and so it quickly became, it was quickly, I realized I can't manage this project. <laughs> like there was, there was no way for me to sell it, manage it, build it, and export it. And so the next thing I did was hire a project manager because I felt very comfortable with, you know, with delivering, you know, I, I knew I could build whatever they made. So it was just like, I kept hiring things away from my strength set. Like the, the hardest thing for me to do, I hired out. And I remember very, very early in Mavericks, I was listening to, it was like the cadets call or something back then, like where, um, I think it was Pete and Christina that were talking about, it, but they were saying like, write down the things that you suck at, like, what do you hate doing and get rid of those things first. And I was like, Oh, I hate project management. So it was like, it was a really easy like split for me to go. Yeah. I'm going to bring in somebody um, to manage these projects. And now of course, you know, fast forward three years, like he's the, Chris is my general manager. Lee is my creative lead. And yeah, like you said, I don't, I'm out of sales as well now. So I'm pretty much just like the product guy. And, you know, the, you know, I come in and talk to the clients about their strategy sometimes when I'm needed. And otherwise I am not super day to day in the company, which is, is awesome. Mm. Uh, just a shout out to Pete, who's got this great training in Mavericks Club called the Org Chart Builder that helps you build out your future facing org chart and then identify which roles to hire. Uh, in in which order? Mm -hmm. um, so you so Leah's designing, you're developing, you hire a project manager. At what point do you start to think about getting in the weeds a little quicker with the client rather than kind of because at this point you're still selling a project and scoping out how you you think it's going to take this long. So therefore we're going to charge this much and kind of hoping that there's going to be some profit at the end of it. At what point yeah. do you go? you know what, this just isn't, what, what was the inflection point that made you think, I need to fix this process to make sure that we're getting everything we need from the client before we give them a proposal or, a, or an accurate quote? What was missing or what was broken that caused you to dig in and fix that? Uh, that was the uh, enabling of e-commerce. Um, as soon as we started selling e-commerce and building an e-commerce, um, I immediately was like, I'm making a huge mistake here. Um, and it was because we, at the time it was related to the project specs, right? We were really having trouble going, well, how many products is this thing? And what categories do we have? And mm. what's our shipping look like? And how are you going to fulfill? And we started asking all these questions and it just would turn out the client had literally no clue, right? They just are going, I don't know. I just, I, I thought I'd, uh, you know, make t-shirts and sell them online. I have no idea how I'm going to deliver them. And so what started as product specs um, started becoming like, we've got to figure this out before we can actually do it. So the tech side is what tipped me to it. 
but I quickly learned that that could be applied just as equally to a business that says, you know, Hey, we're a landscaping company and we've got, you know, we're doing okay in this 15 mile radius, but we want to go out wider. Right. Well, the same exact principle comes in, like how many GMBs are we in and how many website properties need SEO done and are we running ads? And it just, it would like turn into all these questions that I was really trying to keep my triage calls down to 15 to 20 minutes. And there was no way, like I'd be on the phone with a client for an hour, hour and a half, whatever. And it's like, I still didn't have all the data, right? Like I only knew what I knew. The devs that I had hired had different questions. The designers had different questions. Like I go to talk to Simon, he has different questions about how we're gonna drive traffic. And all of a sudden it's like, there's, I think it was really when I realized that it wasn't my mind only that the client needed. It was, they needed my team to speak into their individual areas of their presence. And when I figured that out, I went, I can't do this, right? Cause I started adding up, how much does it cost me to put, you know, an SEO lead on a call, a tech lead, a design lead, like a content person, how long is this, you know, this is costing me, you know, three, 400 bucks minimally to have this call. And I just, it was like one of those moments of going, I, I got to stop doing this, right? So I either have to stop doing this and just fire off proposals that I have no clue what the end result's going to be, or I have to start getting paid to figure it out. Mm. And that's a big shift in the way that everyone does things, right? The way, like the way that everyone does things in our industry is you you ask questions, you give away some ideas for free, you try and impress the client enough with your experience and your knowledge that they then hire you to do the thing. And then when they've hired you to do the thing and they say, send me a proposal, you put in your best guess at the pricing, right? Yeah. How did you manage, did, like, what, what, what were you thinking? What was your thought pattern when you said, okay, I need to start charging for this discovery process? Were you nervous that clients were going to push back or, or how did you kind of figure out the pricing of it and how did you start to present it in a way that you weren't getting lots of pushback from clients? Yeah, so the, the very first one of these that I did was, uh, I won't say the client's name, but they were an e-commerce client and they, they approached me and said, hey, we want you to participate in this RFP. They're a very large nonprofit in Nashville. And they're like, we want you to do this RFP. They were basically looking for a black sheep agency that wasn't in Nashville. And we were small enough to kind of fit that bill, but they also had to get, you know, all these other statements of work and all this stuff. Well, I flipped it on them and they sent me their RFP and I was like, this doesn't make any sense. Like, how are you going to do this and this and this? And I started asking all these questions in email and they said, we don't know yet. Like, we're just kind of looking on the, get the price i was like yeah i don't have time to do that like i can't do that it's gonna this is gonna take me you know 15 hours to figure out what you guys need i can't do that i said but i'll tell you what i can do is i can charge you 1500 bucks and i can get on a call with you and we can figure all this out and then when we do you'll actually have accurate information you can go rfp this to whoever you want but i won't i don't want to do that and i think they were just like you do you what like you know, what do you mean you're not going to do the RFP? I'm like I don't want to do the RFP, but I will help you figure this out. And it was like we got done figuring the thing out, and they never submitted the RFP. They just they went well. We're not going to do an RFP now because the board of directors has just decided that since you made the plan and you already gave us an estimate to do the plan, like we may as well just have you. Like why would we RFP this? because it doesn't make any sense. And I, so we ended up winning what ended up being close to a $40,000 project it was an RFP, no RFP. And on top of that, they've been a retainer client now for almost a year. So mm. it's like, it, and we're getting ready to go into some other services with them as well. So it was, it'll probably equate to be about $150,000 win that I got off of saying, no, I don't want to do this free process where I give you all my IP and you take it and the cheapest agency gets the, you know, wins the, rings the bell. Like I just didn't want to do it. And I knew that's what it was going to 
that's always what an RFP is. Like they always totally. say they're not going to do that, but it's exactly what they're going to look at the prices and go, this one's yeah. the second from the lowest. So we'll pick that one. I mean, yeah, so you're right. just, you're wasting all this time and gambling. And at the end of the day, it's likely that agency doesn't know any different their you know, their RFP, the, the agency that's going to provide that service is going to be asking the client what they want. And the answer is the client has no freaking clue. They don't know. Mm -hmm. And so it was like, it was just this realization that the position of power is not always the person with the money. It's the person mm -hmm. with the need. They had a much greater need than I had. Like mm -hmm. I didn't need their project. They really needed this thing to work. And so I just leveraged that you know, in a way where I said, I'm not going to do what you're asking because I don't think it's smart. And they were like, what, what, wait, what, like, what do you mean? Everyone does this. And I'm like, yeah, we yeah. don't, we don't participate. So it was definitely, uh, after that I went, huh, like <laughs> this is, there's definitely something to doing this. And so we've done different versions of it. We scaled it back for, um, you know, really small business, it's like a tiny business. Sometimes we'll do it for like 250 bucks, right? It doesn't have mm -hmm. to be like a, you know, a, you, you know, this massive thing. It's just getting them to take a step with us, put a little skin in the game, mm -hmm. and then let our team figure out what they need. And then from there, most of the time we end up going into some sort of project. So it, it's, it was, it's like a game changer, but it all stemmed out of just feeling like what those guys what they were asking for, I just could not like morally give them because I knew everything in that RFP list was, you know, crap. Mm. So, mm. yeah. The, so, there is so much to unpack here, man. Yeah, you're doing so Sorry. many things right there. Like you're, you're building trust, right? Because it's all about trust. So you're, you're yeah. proving to them that you know what the hell you're talking about and you're building trust. You're probably or possibly expanding the project beyond the borders that they thought they were, you know, you're, you're adding things to the project because you're discovering where they really yeah. need to be. And the, my favorite part of the entire thing is you're getting paid to do the sales process. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. And it, it's, it, it carries a lot of weight too now that I'm not the salesperson, right? So when Teresa gets on a call with a client that says, Hey, we're building this snow removal company up and, you know, Canada and you know they want to you know expand their business she sells that track builder but then that meeting with the client is head of development head of design head of strategy head of content and so immediately that person who in a one-on-one -on -one with the salesperson they have all the power now they've walked into a room with people that know a thousand times more than they do about all of this and immediately they go backwards going whoa I thought I knew what I wanted, but I have no idea. So I'm just going to tell you about my business and answer all your questions. And it immediately changes the power that they, they, they are now going, Oh crap. Like I just walked into a room with all the sledgehammers and I, I thought I was going to control this and they quickly figure out they just can't like, they don't know enough. So they start going away from I want into, well, what do you guys think I should do? And as soon as that, pivot happens it's like it's just a totally different working relationship with the client now it's not i demand this it's what do you guys want to do to solve this problem which is if it, it's more of a team effort you know then it's like it feels like they're winning the whole process away and mm -hmm. hey we've had some people that have gone through track builder that didn't sign right they took our plan and went to someone really cheap and they executed it happens um mm -hmm. but i never feel bad about it because we get paid to figure it out. Like if it's not a good fit for them, I'd rather them not work with us, right? Like I'd rather them just walk away. So it, it really gives us a chance to vet those clients too and sort of go, does this feel right? You know, is, is this a good, is this going to be good for all of us? And um, I had a client in a track builder recently where I told them I didn't think it was a good fit. And they spent an hour on the phone selling me on working with them. Like it was a completely, I was like, this company is huge. And it's just, yeah, it was just crazy. I'm like, is he, he's literally telling me right now all the reasons why I should work with him. He increased his own budget by 15 grand on a call. He set his own monthly retainer several thousand dollars higher than I thought he needed. And he just, he just kept telling me how, we needed to work together. And I was like, 
well, I guess we do. Like, I, I guess I was wrong. Like, you know, I, I just, it's, it's just so weird how it shifts the way they look at your bit, you know, your team yeah. and, and what you do. Well, it's a, it's a, this is what I love about positioning is that, you know, the, first of all, a couple of things for people who are listening. RFP stands for Request for Proposal, for those uh, who don't know. And Track Builder is Adam's version of paid discovery. That's his productized version of paid discovery. Other people run Track Builder, by the way. Adam doesn't do the Track Builder and he now doesn't sell the Track Builder. He was until recently and now Teresa is selling the Track Builder. So, so technically speaking, a client could come into Milltown Digital get on a call with someone, be sold track builder, go through the track builder process and then and then ascend into a larger project and Adam wouldn't meet them. He wouldn't even know who they are. Sometimes he comes in and talks a little bit about strategy and does the dog and pony show just to add a bit of trust and a bit of credibility, but sometimes he doesn't even know who they are, right? Um, yeah. what, what you've done here also is what Oren Claff talks about framing and prizing. So you make Mule Town Digital the prize rather than the client the prize just because the client has the money doesn't mean they're the prize and i think that's what a lot of people miss is because they have the money we think they're the prize and we need to do whatever they say so that they give us the money right yep. um one thing i want to ask is how like you obviously had nothing to lose when the first big non-profit came in and said they wanted to do e-commerce you had nothing to lose and so you, except 15 hours of unpaid time, right? That right. was just, yeah. that was just a, you made a decision. It was just a choice. It was simply a choice to not waste 15 hours of your unpaid time in the hope that you would then get a spot in the lineup. I've always thought of an RFP as a lineup. We know who's guilty. We just need some other blokes who look similar to come in and fat out the lineup, but none of yeah. you are going to jail because we know who did it, right? That's what an RFP is. We know who we're going to hire. We just need to submit three other quotes to the board so it looks like we've done our due diligence there are complete waste of time in in my opinion um i did one once and then never did another one again um the uh so 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 you make that choice was it just out of pure frustration that you made that decision to go you know what i don't care like i just don't need this project i don't care i'm like or did you have enough work on that it was like well i don't really need the money so it's no big deal if this doesn't happen it was kind of around that it was a it was, i was in a place where like i didn't need this whole side of it to call it. like i didn't need that sale um and so it was like i just remember thinking boy if i screw this up on the south side of this proposal we're going to be eating it for a year right it, it was just it, it was just like it, I think it was just the realization of how bad this could go if we don't get this right and to be honest I started thinking about like, yeah, it's like, it's a time waste, right? Like now I'm sitting here figuring this thing out for these people that don't know what they need. They don't know what they want. I'm figuring it out for them. And it doesn't make sense. And to be completely honest, it's not helping them. Like me doing an RFP did not serve them, but having a technical discovery did because they started figuring out things like, we're going to have to hire somebody on to do this, right? I'm like, yeah, yeah. You're going to have to deal with taxes. You're going to have to figure out how you're going to get these people to ship these things. Like it, it opened up their eyes to the fact that they did not have the answers that they thought they had. And as soon as they saw that, I think they would have had tremendous value in going through that. Their project would have been more successful, even if they went RFP and we didn't get it. I'm confident it would have been a better project for them. And so it was the feeling that I was like, by just jumping in the RFP, I was like, I'm just wasting their time. Mm -hmm. Like it was mm -hmm. like, I'm not helping. And mm -hmm. so I always like feel like in sales, it's like, is this going to help them? Mm -hmm. If the answer mm -hmm. is no, then I'm wasting my time and their time. Then I start going, can I help them for free? And how much can I do? Like, some of these small, somebody asked on here uh, about, Peter asked about like how I base the pricing. It's completely based typically on either how difficult this thing looks like. If their project looks like it's going to be extremely complex, like there's tech and API components and then there's search engine components. Like if it's big, we've gone up, uh, I think the highest one we've done is over six grand. And that went all the way through like a wireframing process. Um, mm. if it's a little tiny business and we're talking about, you know, foot and ankle, it's like, all I'm trying to do is get to their site map. What are the pages they need? How complex is the copy going to be? 
And then ultimately, like, that's what we're trying to do internally. What we're trying to do externally is get them to think about their website differently. So it's a, it kind of is like an educational piece for the client as well as get that, you know, them getting the, the manual that we give them back that tells them what they, you know, should do. So it's, it's really the salesperson's call on how, how much she thinks she needs in order to, to serve the client appropriately. Mm. I love this. There's a, there's a real attitude of uh, service here to the client. Like, uh, uh, you know, if I can't, like the problem with RFPs and not to spend too much time here, but the problem with RFPs is that they don't know the questions that they should be asking. Yeah. Right. If they did, they wouldn't need to hire a bloody agency because they would have figured it out by now. So yeah. the best RFP, in fact, if the only way to use RFPs, I think, in an agency is to offer a service where you help people write an RFP. Right? You yeah. help government or non-profits or large corporate write the RFP, which they then submit. And I'll tell you something, whoever, the, if you help someone write the RFP, you will get the project 100% yeah. of the time because you know more about this project now than anyone. And they'll, that's how you win RFPs is you actually say, well, uh, great, if you guys have got an RFP, the only RFPs we submit are ones that, where we've helped you write the RFP because 90% of the time you guys don't know the questions that you should be asking. I yeah. love the fact that you didn't, you weren't afraid to walk away and say no to this opportunity. And also your, because your approach was, I'm not doing them any favors by submitting this RFP because there are all these unanswered questions. There are all these gaps in, there are all these, exactly what James Murgatroyd says, RFPs always boilerplate and speak to a vague assumption of what the problem might be. Exactly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah love it. Um, and uh, for J James, if you're paying attention, there's now actually four. James knows what I'm talking say, about. Yeah. But anyway, um, uh, this will be a thing that happens now. So, um, uh, <laughs> see who plays along. Um, Adam's like, I have no idea what you're talking about. Uh, so, so you build track builder. You build this productized paid discovery. You then give it to the team, and the team start running it. What happens to your conversion rate from people? First of all, I'm going to tee you up here because I know it's easier to sell a paid discovery product for $1,500 to a complete stranger than it is to sell a $15,000 website to a complete stranger, right? Yeah. So how does selling paid discovery, and, and you were the one that said to me, hey, dude, this sales process you've, you've taught us is great, but I've shortened it because I'm just selling paid discovery straight off a triage call. Is that just yeah. because you're, in, you're impatient? Yeah, I mean, a lot of it was just like, uh, by the time I got through talking to them, for, you know, for 15 minutes, it's like, yeah, I already know where this is going, right? Like, it's like, I have done so many of these calls now that I just started going, okay, I'm, I know that you'd have no idea what you're trying to actually do. You don't know where you're going to get traffic from. You have, all you know is you want this website that you think is ugly now to look better. And what you're missing is what the crap are you going to do with the thing once you have it? They just, they just didn't know. And so it, it was, it was really one of those situations where I just got to the point of going, I'd rather have a 30 minute call with them and mm -hmm. sell them something and do the triage, then wait and then book. And I just didn't want to go through all that. It was just faster for me to be mm -hmm. able to call it on that triage and say, yes, I want to send them to a paid discovery or I don't want to work with this client, or yeah. this is so obvious that I know we're looking at a 6,000 or 8,000 or 12, whatever. If I knew it, I just call it on the call and say, this is what it's going to be. But it yeah. took having like almost too much work, right? Like when, you know, you need 30 grand to clear your books and you have 50, it gets really easy to start making those kind of calls because it's like, mm. well, I don't need to close anything. <laughs> like I don't, it's a, so it was for me, I was just in that position where I could make that move and I thought it was going to impact sales negatively, but to your point it did not is mm -hmm. if most of the time probably about 75 percent of them went if we sent them a paid you know track builder they would agree to it almost always and mm -hmm. of those we've probably done at least 10 or 15 of them now um in the last year and of those we've only lost one that didn't come in and wow. so it's like the conversion rate is so high because by the time we're done with that call, 
and we deliver them our little loom with their PDF and we've gone through it all, they're going, well, like, great. And in that, we also tell them, this is what it would take for us to execute this. Like, this is the, mm -hmm. the cost. Instead of them saying no, if the budget's too high or they can't fit, they would come back and say things like, um, can you do this monthly? Like, can we break it into monthlies instead of a project price? Or I know you're saying this needs to be like 12 grand. I literally only have 10. What can we take out to make it work? Like it just changed from us begging for the job to them coming back and saying, look, we want to work on this. This is legitimate. They trusted us, right? So they would tell us like, this is where we legitimately are. This is all the budget I can get what needs to be moved around so we can do it. And so it just, mm. it's like a totally different response than the send the proposal, wait for crickets, follow up two weeks later. Like it, it requires almost no follow up. Like it, you just send the thing off and a couple of days later, typically they've watched the video and they've looked at it. They've maybe made some comments on the PDF. And then before you know it, it's like, they're saying, hey, I'm ready to sign, or can we like adjust, if we decided we do want you to do a logo, can you put that in there? It's like, mm -hmm. and it's just, it's really a different um, a different world. Whole different conversation, isn't it? And so to be yeah. clear, the headline for this episode of the Agency Hour, ladies and gentlemen, is Adam Silverman is converting clients who buy Track Builder, which is his paid discovery, right? converting those clients into a larger project at 85 to 90% of the clients that go through that paid discovery process are then becoming clients who are investing more and more with Mealtown Digital to get the solution they need. Um, what I love about this as well is that a confused mind does nothing, right? So when you, when you, if you, if, even if you have a great sales process with someone, even if you've been through one of our trainings and you've got your sales pr process dialed in, you're still trying to pitch maybe a $15,000 project to a client that you've known for maybe two or three weeks. And there's lots of detail in there that they're not sure about. They get a little bit confused, which is why they don't pull the trigger. It's not always pricing that people don't pull the trigger, right? It's, it's, it can be timing and it can also be, I just don't really understand what I'm getting for my 15 grand. Yeah. The, the paid discovery just smooths that process out. And what I love about this is, if you give people one option when they come into your world, if you're like, well, the only way you can work with us is to go through a paid discovery. I don't care who you are or what you're doing or what the project is or how big the budget is or what the complexity is. The only way to work with us, to start with us, is to go through this paid discovery, Call it, don't call it paid discovery, call it something sexier, and it's X amount, then there's no confusion. They've got one choice to make. We want to work with Milltown Digital, we've got to do Track Builder. If we don't, if we don't want to do Track Builder, we don't want to follow their process, we don't work with them. And this is, yeah. if you look at every professional service, anyone in the medical industry, banks, lawyers, accountants, they've all got that process dialed in. They dictate the terms of engagement. You don't get the opportunity to tell them how you're going to engage with them. If you want to engage them, you have to follow their process. Right? And I, I think that's for some reason, I don't know why, but for some reason, it's really hard for our audience to understand that. Why, like, mm. why is that? Is it because we all started basically as freelancers and like we have this scarcity mindset and this, you know, like what is it about well, that concept? Because well, we, I, we are victims to it, not victims, mm -hmm. but we are the, on the other end of it mm -hmm. often. So yeah. uh, why we are, why we're as consumers, we fall into other people's process all the Absolutely. time. Right. But as business owners and service providers, we're reluctant to dial that process in. And I think it's because back to what Oren Claff mm -hmm. talks about in pitch anything is we see the client as the prize because they have the money. What we forget, and also because we live in this echo chamber of Facebook groups where we're all doing the same thing, what happens is it, it, it alters your, your world view and you think that everyone knows how to do what you do because everyone you talk to most of the day online knows how to do what you do right and we're comparing strategies and tactics and we're showing each other our websites and we're showing each other the fancy results we're getting for clients we're like well everyone knows how to do this no 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 everyone in our industry knows how to do this but that's like less than 0.1 of a percent of the population of the world. Let, let me let me also just give you this as proof. You go to any of the search tools, like you go to 
BuzzFeed or any of those search tools which kind of shows you the kinds of topics that are getting shared on social media and you type in anything to do with WordPress or plugin or you know GitHub or anything technical or anything design related user experience user interface this that gets shared maybe three times a month on social media versus the Kardashians that get shared three times a second <laughs> right so to put it into some kind of perspective what it is we do 99.99999 percent of the people on the planet don't know how to do what we do so we are the prize not them just because they've got the money right because just because they've got the money doesn't mean it's profitable money that they've got we are the prize and i think it's important to remind ourselves of that on a daily basis that you have the skills you have the solution here you are the prize therefore you have the opportunity to dictate the terms of engagement you don't have to follow the client's process and i guarantee you they don't have a process and if they do it's not a good one so get them to follow your process because at least you've got one um a couple of questions here i think uh james murgatross is curious what has or hasn't worked in positioning paid discovery early if you could go back and talk to uh yourself a year ago and give yourself a bit of a, a, a you know a, a 30 second lesson on how to do this and how to set this up in the agency what would you do like what's the what's a couple of the key lessons that you've learned over the last year or so doing this i mean i think like one of the big ones is it is better their strength in numbers on these calls um because if it's like flip the round where it's just you on this call i mean and if you're if you're a solopreneur or you're you're like you know you're the primary on 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 your projects and then you have a team that just does the work it's kind of different um with our agency the the main thing i learned quickly was if they're going to be working with John, Leah, Teresa, like if that's who they're going to work with on their project, why would I tell them what they need to do, right? Like it immediately disempowers my team and makes me the point person. Like I, once you're that person, it's really hard to get out of being that person. So I would go back and tell myself, if you want to be that person, do this by yourself. If you don't, then have someone else be there with you that can also speak into their project. That way, when the transition occurs that you're not the person calling the shots, it's really a lot easier for you to exit out of that conversation. Um, so that would that'd be like one big lesson. Um, and then, you know, the other side of it is if a client, <laughs> I'll say this, if a client says no, to doing a two, three, four, five hundred dollar thing, they're just price shopping. So mm-hmm. you're going to either win that project because think about this: if you win that project, you are probably the cheapest person they could find, which should yep. frighten you a little bit. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, and then the second side of that is if they're not willing to spend money to figure out what they need to do, what are they going to spend? They're not going to spend anything. They're going to get you to the website and they're going to go. And that for me, it was just a waste of time. Like if they're not going to do anything other than redesign their site and be gone, I'd rather them go somewhere else because I don't have time to mess around with that. And I think I would tell three year younger Adam, don't waste your time with those clients because every one of them that I've ever worked with has been in and out of our ecosystem. It's the ones that we spend the time to build the relationship with that stick around. They not only spend more money with us, but we're more effective for them, which builds our reviews, our case studies. It builds our referral, you know, our referral network. It just, it does everything positive for your business. Whereas working for bottom feeder clients, it just, it just takes the life out of your business. And it, it, it really is not, it's not really what you want. You just think in the moment, I need this $3,000 or $5,000 thing, but you, but it's, you need it because you think you need it. I guess, you know, it's like, I don't know the psychology there, but it feels like you don't really need that thing. Mm. You need, you don't need that client. There's probably a better suited client for you and you can use this to weed those people out 
early on so you don't have to get sucked into a six month long you know project with someone yeah. that you're like i don't like these people so yeah it that can be hard to pick up in a 15 minute triage call but spend an hour on zoom with them with your team your team will throw flags on the field if they're there because they're going to be the ones dealing with them so my team will immediately say that person's going to be a you know what so let's <laughs> increase our price or or like the opposing like it probably should be an eight thousand dollar project but like we really like these people let's can we, what can we do? It, it, you know, you get both sides of that. So yeah. I think that's like what works and, and we, you know, kind of what doesn't, what doesn't work with these things. It's what doesn't work is if all the client can tell you is what they want you to do for them. Right. Like yeah. if that's all they know. Yeah. You're not going to be able to extract enough on that discovery call to make it valuable. So you got to be willing to keep, asking them the same question a bunch of different ways if you're not getting an answer that it's going to help yeah it's like going to the doctor and and saying listen doctor um i've done some research on google and i think <laughs> i have pleurisy and the doctor says well let me run the tests and let me come up with the diagnosis so that we prescribe the right <laughs> medicine um I'm just going to move a couple of things here on the desk to highlight i think james we got to six james i think we got to six uh, including an empty beer bottle so for those of you who are listening to this podcast and have no idea what we're talking about come and join the digital mavericks facebook group play along and see what we're talking about we did we got to six by the end of the show we started with two we got to six including an empty beer bottle from the heineken brewery um, adam, adam so is sitting here and he still doesn't know what you're talking about <laughs> i have no idea <laughs> Um, uh, so now the other thing I wanted to uh, say here is that, and I think you've mentioned it, but I just want to reiterate this point, paid discovery can help you dodge a bullet. It can help you actually, we had a Maverick recently do this, $1,500 for a uh, paid discovery session. A couple of hours later said, you know what, this has been super fun, but I don't want to work with a client because they're super disorganized and if we were to work together, this would just drag on forever because this person just can't get their shit together and there's no way they're gonna be able to deliver content or answer the question. So here's your plan, here's what I would do, but I'm not gonna do it. Just got paid to dodge a bullet, got paid for their time. It's super profitable, move on, it's transactional, but that's okay. You don't have to spend six months trying to uh, make that project profitable or keep that client happy. So. Uh, it can definitely work on the other side of it. Um, this is a great segue, ladies and gentlemen, because you do know, of course, that we are releasing our brand new training tomorrow, I believe. It is called the Paid Discovery Method. Go to agencymavericks.com slash waitlist to get on the waitlist and be the first notified when we open the doors to our brand new training, the Paid Discovery Method, which goes live tomorrow. I was going to share my screen here and give you a bit of a sneak peek into the actual list of uh, trainings that are in the paid discovery, but I'm not gonna do that because we're out of time. But I will tell you a couple of things that we've done. We have uh, the triage call, obviously you've heard uh, Adam talk about that. We're gonna give you uh, basically the script for the triage call with a little twist. We've added a thing called the triage hook, which is how to get people on the triage call. And then what we call the PDM pitch, the paid discovery method pitch, how to actually sell paid discovery off that first triage call. Of course, then we go through onboarding your client into paid discovery, all the workbooks and the slide deck and, and, the, and the PDFs and everything you need to run really professional paid discovery sessions, what to call paid discovery instead of calling it paid discovery. Of course, Adam calls it track builder. We've got a whole thing around uh, some different ideas on how to turn it into a sexy product. Um, and then also the checklist of, of how to run that session. And more importantly, how to then go back and prescribe, once you've done the discovery, how to then go back and prescribe your solution to the client and build out what we call a 12 month roadmap for that client so that they can see, hey, over the next 12 months, this is what we're gonna be working on based on what we discovered during our, our discovery session. Um, and you essentially what you're doing is you're writing yourself a contract for the next 12 months to work with that client. Uh, so super excited to be launching this tomorrow. It's called the Paid Discovery Method. Agencymavericks.com slash waitlist is where you go to get, be the first notified. Um, and Fenwick asked an opens. important question. Yes, it is part of Mavericks. And of course, everything we do is part of Mavericks. Part so of Mavericks. if you are in Mavericks Club, you will get it, of course, because every if you're in Mavericks Club, you get everything, including a complimentary ticket to Mavcon San Diego, September 2022. Dude, I cannot wait. It's two and a half wait. years. Two and a half wait. years Adam, since we were out there. Adam, you're going to be there, there, right? 
Oh, I, yeah, I've already got the order for Valium so I can get on the airplane. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's right. You right. hate flying, don't you? Yeah, you don't like flying. Yeah. Right. The, rock, the rock star that doesn't like to fly. Oh, that's I hate right. it, man. Yeah. Yeah, once once you're in a private plane, you don't like commercial anymore. <laughs> right. Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> it's so bad. Yeah, exactly. Oh, exactly. Uh, it's super exciting. I cannot wait to be out in San Diego hanging out. So, I, uh, so we need to, we need to so say much. that that other people other than Mavericks are going to be allowed to come to this. That's right. Number, you know, we, we're, That's we're right. I, I, have, it I have no idea how this works, by yeah, the we way. Don't, we, um, we don't tell Troy anything, but we don't, a certain anything. number of people will be allowed to come to, to it and uh, we'll, we'll open up a wait list for that or a sign-up list for that pretty soon. Um, mm. Yeah. You got to right. be serious about wanting to do something with us, obviously, mm -hmm. but you know, yeah. we yeah. want to work with you. That's why we're there. So if you want to come and if you want to come and kick the tires and check out what Mavericks Club is all about, uh, email support at agencymavericks.com and ask them about Mavcon coming up in San Diego in September. It is the week after WordCamp. WordCamp US is September 9, 10 and 11, I think, or around yes. about those dates, a Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Um, and then Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, we go straight into Mavcon in San Diego uh, the week after um, uh, WordCamp US. You also get to hang out with Adam Silverman, myself, Pete Perry, Johnny Flash, Christina Hawkins and all the other Mavericks are going to be there. Uh, it's going to be super fun. So if you want to come along and kick the tyres and check out what Mavericks Club is all about, as Pete said, you've you got to be serious about working with us. Um, but if you want to come and have a sneak peek, email support at agencymavericks.com and the team will tell you how that happens because I have no freaking idea, but they have figured it out. Yes, Adam's got his hand up on a podcast. Excellent. I'm just, I'm just telling you. It will change. It, I went there going, I don't really know what in the world I'm doing here. And I have no idea like how this is going to be helpful because I was so overwhelmed. But I mean, just to be two years later and basically like moved out of my business into a CEO role, like I would not have ever been able to do that without the help of Troy and Pete and, the, and all the other coaches. Like it just completely changed the entire way that I look at my company. So even if you take out all the tangible things I got and the mindset change is, is what it's like life altering when you understand your business at, at a different, like when you can look at it from the way the coaches look at your business, it's just, it's, it's life changing. So if you, if you're thinking about it, like this is no promo for me, I'd love to see you there just to say hello. I give out free hugs, handshakes, but <laughs> for real, like if you're, if you're not sure what to do, it's, it's it's probably what you need to do yeah awesome thank you brother appreciate it Thanks, and it's man. been it's but your journey has been incredible to be a part of i remember you joined mavericks club a month later the world went into lockdown with COVID. everyone shit the bed you yeah. and i jumped on calls we kind of figured it out we were everyone was just kind of panicking and you just dug in man you just dug in and took massive action and did the work and that's what's most rewarding about working with you in mavericks club is uh is seeing the action that you take and the results that you get so Appreciate you. Appreciate you coming on the Agency Hour and sharing your story here. And uh, cannot wait to hang out again in September uh, for Mavcon. Yeah. Yep. Thank you all. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Pete. Crispy Butter right. Perry. Thank you for playing along, ladies and gentlemen. Please uh, send us some comments, subscribe to the podcast, share it with your friends, and join the Digital Mavericks Facebook group. And if you've got any feedback or you want to talk to us at all, just reach out, support at agencymavericks.com. We will see you again next week on the Agency Hour. Until then, I'm Troy Dean. Take care. Have a great day. Take Bye care, for now. Guys.